Greetings, friends. My name is Tesha Mallory, and I'm the Director of Worship here at United Theological Seminary. And I would like to welcome you to our August 2020 Doctor of Ministry opening worship service. During this time, you will hear from different leaders of the institution, hear a spirit-filled message, take part in prayer with one another, and worship the Lord. So as we center our hearts in worship today, I invite you to hear the psalm call to worship led by Dean of the Chapel, Dr. Rosario Picardo. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Good evening and welcome to our annual Monday evening opening worship service. We're glad that each one of you have gathered here with us. Let us pray. God, we come to you this evening lifting up your holy name in glory, honor, and praise. As we worship, 
give us willing spirits to be conformed into the image and likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. Ready our hearts to receive your word and transform us by the power of the Holy Spirit into a church prepared and empowered to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. It is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit that we all say together, Amen. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce our outstanding academic dean. I'm going to let us all welcome him to our stand this evening. Greetings, friends, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and welcome to the August 2020 Doctor of Ministry Intensive. My name is David Watson, and I'm academic dean here at United and I give thanks to God for all of you, students, faculty, mentors, and staff. I'm grateful that you have chosen to be part of the United community, and I pray that you'll find this week, despite the unusual circumstances, a time of learning and spiritual growth. I regret that we can't be together in person. While I'm grateful for this marvelous technology that allows us to be together virtually, I do miss the fellowship and dynamism that comes from the gathered body of Christ. I look forward to better days when we can see one another face to face, but until then, we trust that the Holy Spirit will bind us together in love despite our physical separation. The theme for this intensive is ministry in times of crisis, and it is certainly appropriate today. 2020 has been a brutal year. We face a global pandemic, crises of racial justice, deep political and ideological tension within the United States, and what is sure to be a contentious upcoming presidential election. This is the most chaotic time I have ever lived through. It is ever more apparent that we sinful and broken humans cannot save ourselves. The church is the most important institution in the world because only the church proclaims the good news about the only one who can save us, Jesus. We live in times of crisis, but no crisis is more powerful than the God of all creation who came to us in Jesus and abides with us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Our work as Christian leaders is crucial today as we offer healing, comfort, and reconciliation through Jesus, as we work for justice and righteousness in our world, and as we step into situations of crisis that others might flee. This week, as we talk about ministry in times of crisis, may God open our minds and hearts to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Good evening. I'm Kent Millard, President at United Theological Seminary. And it is a joy to welcome you to this evening worship service for the beginning of our Doctor of Ministry program in August of 2020. I wish we could be worshiping together live and face to face, that we could see each other in our cohort groups and see the lecturers face to face. However, that's not possible because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But my prayer is that all of us will still grow spiritually, intellectually, and relationally in spite of the uh, virtual nature of these performances, of these programs. We've had some significant transitions in, uh, announced in our uh, Dr. Ministry program. Dr. Harold Hudson has been on staff for 17 years at United and he's been our Associate Dean for Doctoral Studies for the past 11 years. When Dr. Hudson became head of the Doctoral Ministry program, we had 131 Doctoral Ministry students. This August, we'll have around 200 Doctoral Ministry students in the DMIN program. And this is all due to the inspiring and enthusiastic leadership of Dr. Harold Hudson over the past 11 years. It's increased 53% since he took over the program. 
while many seminaries are experiencing a declining enrollment, United is experiencing some growth in our enrollment, largely because of the number of students coming into our doctoral ministry program. And for all of that, we give thanks and praise to God for the leadership of Dr. Harold Hudson. Dr. Hudson informed us recently that he has decided to retire as Associate Dean for Doctoral Studies in August 31st, 2021, a year from now. Dr. Hudson's executive assistant, Janice Kronauer, has also said that she wants to retire at the same time, and she has served in that position for 19 years. So next year, during the August intensive, on uh, the Wednesday night, August 31st, uh, we will have a special celebration for honoring uh, Dr. Hudson and Janet Kronauer for their ex exceptional work in leading our doctoral ministry program for many years. We're also pleased to announce that Dr. Elvin Sadler, General Secretary of the African Methodist Episcopal Church of Zion and a senior minister, men, mentor in our doctoral program for the last 15 years, will become our new Associate Dean for Doctoral Studies starting September 1st, 2021, a year from now. And during this transition year, Dr. Sadler will serve as an Assistant Dean for Doctoral Studies to help make a true smooth transition from Dr. Hudson. Deanna York, who currently works as an admission associate in our enrollment department, will become the executive assistant for doctoral studies on September 1st, 2021, and will work with Janice during this next year for a true smooth transition in the administration of our program. We thank God for the outstanding faculty, administration, and staff, mentors, that we have leading all the ministries and educational opportunities here at United in preparing faithful and fruitful Christian leaders who make disciples of Jesus Christ. We also want to welcome uh, new Doctor of Ministry cohort leaders, Dr. Michael Beck and Reverend George Acevedo, who are leaders in the Fresh Expression Church Renewal Movement. Dr. Beck is senior pastor at the Wildwood United Methodist Church in Wildwood, Florida. Is also the leader for the Florida United Methodist Annual Conference Fresh Expressions Movement along with Reverend Acevedo. Reverend Acevedo is a longtime friend and he pastors the Grace United Methodist Church in Fort Myers, Florida, which is a multi-site congregation with about 2,600 people in worship each week, each weekend, uh, under his inspiring leadership. Dr. Beck and Reverend Acevedo have enrolled 10 new Doctor of Ministry students and they will begin their cohort ministry this week. So we wanna welcome that new cohort on Fresh Expressions. Next year, we start a hope, hope to start a Fresh Expressions House of Study here at United, which will enable more master students to learn the uh, ministries of Fresh Expressions as a part of their educational program here at United. We also want to share with you another church renewal group, which will join us at the intensive week next January 25th to the 29th, 2021. The Mosaic Movement prepares leaders to develop healthy, multi-ethnic congregations all over the world. It is led by Dr. Mark DeMaz and Dr. Harry Lee from Little Rock, Arkansas. Dr. DeMaz and Re Dr. Lee and Reverend Chip Freed, pastor at the Garfield United Methodist Church in Cleveland, Ohio, and Mrs. Onia Okubuo, will be, uh, is a founder of the 21st Century Church in Cincinnati, will be leading our D-Men Week in January of 2021. They'll be doing the worship, the lecturing, so that we all understand how we can become more multi-ethnic. We're bringing these leaders here to help all of us think and act more multi-ethnically so that our congregations here on earth can better reflect the congregation of the Kingdom of God, which is multi-ethnic. Dr. DeMaz and Reverend Freed will also lead a new Doctor of Ministry cohort in January for those pastors who are interested in becoming leaders in multi-ethnic congregations. Last February, we had a visioning retreat at United led by Reverend Sue Nelson Kibbe, where we prayed that God would bring new innovations to United. Our desire was that we could begin to reach more pastors and more congregations with uh, church renewal efforts. And then by the grace of God, it's as if the uh, 
the Fresh Expressions Group and the Mosaic Group have just come and we've worked a wonderful partnerships with these groups, which will reach a whole new group of people uh, in the Ministry of Education at United. God is doing a new thing here at United, and we give God the thanks, the glory, and the praise for all that is happening. We are delighted that this evening, our preacher for the evening is Dr. Philip Pointer. Dr. Pointer is senior pastor at St. Mark's Baptist Church in Little Rock, Arkansas, and chair of the Department of Philosophy and Religion at Philander Smith College in Little Rock. Dr. Pointer joined the St. Mark family as senior pastor in 2012. He earned his Doctor of Ministry degree from United Theological Seminary in 2014. He earned his Master of Divinity degree with honors in the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia. Dr. Pointer has served in the ministry for more than 25 years. Dr. Pointer and Dr. Charles Goodman Jr. are co-mentors for the men cohort that started last January with 19 students focusing on creative pastoral preaching and leadership. Dr. Pointer and his wife Kenya have three children, Gabby, PJ, and Elijah. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Pointer as our preacher for the evening. And we thank God for all of you, wherever you are, wherever you're participating in this uh, Demon Week. Our prayers is that God is with you and that this will be an inspiring event, even though we can't do it face to face. God bless you all. Thank you. Honor and praise to God, God's Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit who comforts and guides us. And let me honor and thank God for our president, President Millard, and our dean, Dean Hudson, and all of the faculty and those who make up the United Community. And also to those of you who are students on this journey toward doctorates of ministry. It's my great joy to be a part of this intensive, and it is my intent to be helpful as we discuss the theme of ministry in times of crisis. I'd like to do so by looking at a lesson from the life of David in 1 Samuel chapter 30. There I'd like to read 10 verses from 1 Samuel chapter 30 to discuss with us tonight ministry in times of crisis and more specifically crisis leadership. Let me read and then we'll see what the Lord will say to us from this text. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against Negeb and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. And David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. So David set out, and the 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook Besor, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and 400 men. 200 stayed behind, 
who were too exhausted to cross the brook before. Crisis leadership. I don't know if that's a term that you've heard much. Perhaps you're more familiar with the term and with the concepts surrounding what I would call its nefarious cousin, crisis management. Crisis management can be read about and studied. There are sites and trainings and books on crisis management. Now on the surface, crisis management seems like a noble and responsible thing to do. It's three phases, our pre-crisis, crisis response, and post-crisis, crisis management. It's about controlling the narrative around an organization in crisis, telling the story in such a way that the organization maintains a positive public relations standing. Crisis management is concerned with managing the appearance of the organization in the crisis, media, public perception. Crisis management ultimately is the question of how to look good when things go bad. Some of us in the midst of our current crises, both the racial injustice, unfairness, and inequity that we see in this nation, and the persistent health crisis, COVID-19, that was a worldwide pandemic that has now become an epidemic to the U.S., this crisis, these crises, some organizations, some of us who lead and teach and even pastor have simply sought to manage them. We want to save our name or save our church or save our institution. Because of that, we've sought ways to manage the public relation aspect of how we appear to those on the outside, but crisis management, while it seems noble, stops well short of our collective spiritual responsibility. More than being concerned with how we organizationally and personally and ministerially can look good when things go bad. We need to more be concerned, friends, with ministering to and for those who are deeply impacted by these severe circumstances that are beyond their control. We should be concerned about navigating those who are a Affected by these crises to wholeness and restoration. And friends, there is, there is, there is an example of such leadership here in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Now, I'm going to be the first to admit that David is not a paragon of perfect living. In fact, the reality of the crisis that we have read about is, is partially David's own fault in his intent to hide from Saul and to, and to uh, curry favor with Saul's enemies, David attempts to go out and actually help and join forces with his Philistine enemies for a season. And in his absence, away from where he is capitaled with his ragtag bunch of rejects there at Ziklag while he is away. Here come the Amalekites, this rotting band of raiders who come in, take the women, take the children, and take all that David and his men possess. David is not a perfect paragon of living or leadership. He makes extreme and egregious 
errors in his life of leadership, both on his way to the throne and after he arrives at the throne. But in this text, I believe this weak, oftentimes extremely flawed man teaches us something about crisis leadership and navigating people who have been affected affected negatively by circumstances beyond their control to wholeness and restoration. Friends, this is what I'm simply trying to suggest, that this text is going to teach us that crisis demands that we develop a holistic, healthy, and holy approach to leading the people of God and as such we should leave this session allowing God to shape us as effective leaders through the crises that we find ourselves in crisis is a shaper a developer a revealer a corrector a chastiser and that's Friends, what the opportunity is for all of us in the days in which we live. We have the opportunity to allow the crisis to reveal our deficiencies, but also to develop in us some competencies so that we can be better leaders in the days to come. I'd, I'd like to walk this narrative tonight and, and offer to you a, a few places that we can put our focus Areas where we can develop as leaders for the sake of crisis leadership. There are, there are a handful of focuses. Here they are. Um, there is an inward focus. There is an upward focus. And there is an outward focus. Did you get it? Let me say it again. There's an inward focus, an upward focus, and an outward focus that that's that's those are the marks I see those signposts on the road of this narrative that I'd like to leave with you please note that David demonstrates responsible holy and healthy crisis leadership by focusing on things inwardly L look at the narrative again the women and and children are taken captive small and great they're all alive, but David and his men do not know this. And look at the inward focus. Verse 4 says, David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's wives were gone as well. And verse 6 says, David was greatly distressed because they talked about stoning him because they were all bitter in soul. David then, according to verse 6, strengthened himself in the Lord his God. I, I, I'd like to rush to that self-strengthening, but we cannot do so by, by, by rushing past what precedes it. David does develop an inward fortitude and an inward strength to go forward, but he does not get there immediately, and he does not get there quickly. As leaders, we must care for ourselves internally in order to lead responsibly externally but look at the process that he goes through to get to a place of internal spiritual psychological and emotional health he starts with grief verse 4 says David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept. And you, my friend, will never be a good leader if you save your tears for your secret places. Those who follow us need to know that we too can be touched and we feel and we hurt and we cry and the burdens of our season are on our shoulders as well. Rather than try to present yourself as Superman or Superwoman, rather than try to present yourself as Mighty Mouse, present yourself as a partner in pain, Present yourself as someone who understands what sorrow and suffering feels like. David leads out in the weeping. 
Because, friends, grief is healthy and it is even holy. It's Michael Card who writes a book called A Sacred Sorrow, where he argues that what we have lost in this season of the Christian church is the language of lament. Friends, you're not ready to lead if you're unable to weep with and for those under your charge. There must be an inward space for grief in your life. People have lost homes and cars and businesses because of this health crisis. Many have lost lives. Some of us drive down the street nervous, afraid, concerned that we might not make it home to our families because of racial injustice. Schools are still receiving funding based on the property taxes of the neighborhood around it and so poor communities are disproportionately uh, affected by having low funding where it's needed the most. These crises cannot be rushed through and we must learn how to cry about that. Not in the closet, but in, in the sanctuary, in front of those who follow us. There must be space for grief inwardly that acknowledges, look at it say David is stressed because the people are talking of stoning him and their, their emotional response, friends, is understandable. It's not that they're mad as much as they are hurt and so David has to then come to the place where he strengthens himself. He encourages the old King James says himself. He builds himself up in the Lord his God. He is able to grieve with them publicly, to not hold against them their uh, knee-jerk emotional reaction against him and yet to find space and time to be with God in a way that brings him back to a place of strength. David is an example but not the perfect one of this. Jesus is the best example of this inward focus as Isaiah 53 and 3 calls him a man of sorrows who is acquainted with grief. We see Jesus grieving in the garden of Gethsemane, his impending death, and yet in the time of his impending death where he sorrows such that sweat falls from his brow like drops of blood, where he asks the Father to take the cup of wrath away from him so that he does not have to drink it, yet Jesus stays there and finds strength to go all the way to the cross. And so the hymnologist asks, did Christ or sinners weep and shall our cheeks be dry? Let floods of penitential grief spring forth from every eye. The Son of God in tears, the angels marveled see. Be thou astonished, O my soul. He shed those tears for me. He wept that we might weep. Each sin demands a tear. In heaven alone no sin is found and there is no weeping there. We must learn to cry with and for the those we lead. David shows us what an inward focus looks like, but then David shows us what, what an upward focus looks like. In the midst of this crisis, the loss of wives and children, the life, the life, the life of their wives and children are at stake. They don't know if they are dead or alive. We have the narrative knowledge to know that they are not dead, but, but David then asks Abiathar in verse 7, who is a priest, son of Ahimelech, he says, bring me the ephod, that garment worn by the priest for the sake of prayer and seeking God. And he asks God outright, shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? God answered, pursue, for you shall surely overtake and you will rescue. That old King James says, recover. Oh, look, friends, at David understanding that while there is an immediate need, he needs divine permission for his human passion. Did you hear me? 
He knows there is a need. They need to pursue this band of raiders. They need to find out if their wives and children are alive. They need to get their stuff back. But David says to God, I'm not going unless you give me permission and a promise of success. So many of us inwardly strengthen ourselves in verse 6, but do not upwardly seek direction because all of your ideas are not divine vision if everything you think is good to do may not be your responsible assignment there's nothing nothing worse than sincere passion outside of the will of God we see it every day, people who want to make the world a better place. We see it with those who want to bring about fairness and justice, but use ungodly means to do so. And in so doing, they are frustrated by their lack of success because God is only obligated to bless what God has sanctioned. David surely could have gone after this Malachite troop. He is a competent and capable warrior, general, and a leader. He's not lost a battle that we know of in the scripture all the way back to lions and bears, defeating giants, overcoming Philistines as the son-in-law of Saul. But there is something in him that knows that he cannot win without God's hand on it. And friends, as you're doing your strategic plan for re-entry or continued uh, in, uh, uh, experiences in your sanctuary, as you're working out your plan to fight for justice in your area, as you approach your mayor, your county executive, your governor, as you approach the, the intent to help people get to the polls in November before you lay it all out and execute it why don't you ask God is this the right way to get this done and I know God will give us direction and insight and foresight I know God will give us concepts that we had not considered. I know God will give us strategies beyond our experience and education. Leadership, friends, might be a science to some, but it ought to be spiritual to us. His upward focus means that he knows his passion needs God's permission. I'm, I'm finished. Thank you again, Brother President and Brother Dean, for this opportunity. David's David's example shows us an inward focus, an upward focus, and now an outward focus. Verse 9 says, with divine permission and promises, David set out and the 600 men who were with him. Then something strange here. They came to the brook Besor, and they had to leave 200 people behind because they were too exhausted to cross the brook. Well, that outward focus is a plan and a movement against the causes of the crisis. Internally, David grieves and finds strength. Upwardly, David prays and gets permission for his passion. And now outwardly, David goes after aggressively that which causes the crisis. And he's got 600 men, which is not a lot, but he's going to try to pursue God's promises that he will overtake them and he will rescue all. And, and then they come to this brook and 200 of his men are just exhausted. Because our best laid plans are always subject to other people's capacity. And as you aggressively seek to do the will of God in your community, in your context, student, as you get ready to implement a project that should move the 
forward ministry uh, of, of your context and others uh, who read and follow your design as you get ready to lift the gaze of those in your community beyond their issues uh, upward to the God who can liberate them from them there's always going to be some area, some person, some resource that just can't make the whole trip. I, I don't have time to give you the whole chapter, but, but, but here's what happens. David does, in fact, defeat the Amalekites. David does recover all. In fact, they get back some spoils from the Amalekites, and, and David shares that with those 200 left behind. In fact, David's men say we, we shouldn't give them any of the spoils, but David says, no, we're going to share alike. Isn't it interesting that David is compassionate because he understands that people have different capacities? Listen to me again, say it. He's compassionate because he understands that people have different capacities. Come close, listen good, and I'm through. You cannot get a gallon of ministry out of a quart member. Do you hear me? You cannot get a gallon of ministry out of a quart member. Some people are at their capacity at their capacity of watching you online, at their capacity of generosity, at their capacity of service, and ideally they would be able to go with you all the way, but you have to be leader enough to trust the promise of God on your adventure rather than the people around it. Because success was not dependent on whether he had 400 or 600. Success was dependent on the fact that he had heard God say, you will rescue all. So when you can't count on people, you got to count on the promise. Friends, that's what I'd like to leave with you. That God does not break God's promise. In fact, David loses 200 on one side of the brook Besor and then meets a sick servant of these Amalekites on the back side of Besor. And the knowledge and information from this one sick Egyptian servant is worth more than the swords of the 200 he had to leave behind. Friends, God always gives you what you need. And one great preacher said it this way, God knows when to send who, where, with what? As a leader, my friend, I'm saying that you can turn your gaze upward to God and then turn your gaze outward to the issue and watch God make a way for you to succeed. God bless you and keep you. Let us pray. God of mercy, God of comfort, we come before you in this time of suffering in our world mindful of human frailty and need, confused and struggling to find meaning in the face of despair. We are grateful that even as we share in the joy of Christ Jesus, we can also share abundantly in comfort in the midst of suffering. For victims of fire or flood, storm or earthquake, famine or disease, for those whom disaster has left homeless, injured or bereaved, for refugees and those separated from their loved ones, for those individuals and families affected by the coronavirus, for communities suffering from injustice and racism, for all who are in danger, trouble, or anguish, we ask the presence and strength of your spirit. Give all who suffer the love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. We know that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because your love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Be the support of all who give their strength, their skill, and their stamina in a ministry of mercy. Open our hearts in generosity that we may be partners in their commitment 
and bring relief. Where tempers flare and a partisan spirit provokes new hostility, raise up people who have patience and restraint. Where indifference allows crisis to deepen and suffering to go without relief, awaken deliverers who have zeal and strength. We pray for all who are engaged in making important decisions in this time, for those who report these events and for those who shape public opinion. Give them the courage to speak out and the restraint to listen, that together we may discern the truth and hold aloft its light. Take away the temptation to trust in human power and military solutions and give us the courage to be your servants to the community of all nations. Direct all governments in the way of peace and justice that your will may be known and done among the nations. Deliver us from the sins that lead to war and conflict and strengthen within us the will to establish righteousness and justice on the earth. We pray for those who are suffering and can make no sense of tragedy. Help them to turn to the one who embraces us in our lives, Jesus Christ, who lived and suffered among us. There is no one who is righteous, not even one, for we have all turned away from you, God. Make us aware of our common need of a savior and remove from our hearts any pride, ambition, and greed that would lead us to enslave or demean other people. Have mercy on your whole creation and hasten the day when the kingdom of the world shall become your kingdom and by grace make us worthy to stand before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Father, how grateful we are for this opportunity of worship tonight. We thank you for every participant who has shared in this experience, and we thank you for those who have been in our hearing. And now as we prepare to depart, we pray for your blessings upon us, not only on this evening, but throughout this week, as we come together for the purpose of preparing leaders to advance your kingdom and bring glory and honor to your name. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with you henceforth now and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. God bless you. Have a great evening, and we look forward to an exciting day on tomorrow.